We have uh, four speakers uh, representing four of the schools that are part of the environmental initiative uh, at Stanford. We have someone from the business school, from humanities and sciences, from School of Earth Sciences, and then also engineering. And um, we've asked the speakers to focus on the work that they're doing on finding solutions. And I think it's a very important uh, aspect of what we're trying to do at the Woods Institute. And we sort of like to think that that's part and parcel of what, uh, of what um, defines us. So I'm not going to give them uh, long introductions. They are well described in your handouts. So I'm going to just give a one-line introduction and then give them 10 minutes. 10 minutes, and I mean 10 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, at the end for question and answer. So our first speaker is Neil Malholtra. Neil is from the Graduate School of Business, where he's an associate professor. He teaches on ethics and management, and he's going to talk about the CSR lab. Neil? Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for their attention. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank two people. So first is the Woods Institute, who has been involved in funding some of this research. Um, and in addition to some of our partners at eBay, Lori Duvall is here today, and also Caitlin Bristol, who are part of their sustainability team, and really just forward thinkers that are trying to get more data-driven approaches to this very important topic, and have really leveraged a lot of great resources across eBay, including eBay Labs, um, which is basically, along with other organizations like Microsoft uh, Labs, Google Labs, these are kind of the new Bell Labs, um, Xerox Park of this uh, millennium. And so I really hope that a lot of great learning is going to come out of this. Um, so our project, me and my colleagues, is to just answer this question, which is, is corporate, uh, environmental corporate social responsibility profitable? Um, and it's a really hard question to figure out. Um, so oftentimes what people do is they try to correlate some metric of corporate social responsibility, either different initiatives that firms are doing, um, sort of external scores, for example, these KLD scores, and they kind of show that there's some positive relationship um, between what companies are doing and the profits that they're getting. Um, of course, the problem with these correlations is that the direction could be exactly the opposite. Um, so the firms that tend to be represented in this space are extremely high-functioning firms uh, that have organizational slack to participate in these CSR activities. So it's very hard to figure out if it's the CSR that's causing the profitability or the profitability that's causing the CSR. It's also very difficult, even if you were to look at the history of one firm, to see what changes, um, whether they put into practice or not, and see if their profits or sales increase, because you don't know what would have happened if they didn't put in those CSR initiatives. Um, so we're going to try to borrow the logic of randomized controlled trials, which is how we try to figure out whether the medicines all of us take are going to work and whether they're going to hurt us or not. Um, so this has pretty much been the gold standard to figure out if medicines work by the Food and Drug Administration, um, probably you know, for decades now. Um, and it's a way we can actually try to assess cause and effect. So it's kind of impossible to say that some companies are going to do these things and not. Um, that's a very dramatic thing to randomize. But at least what we can do is focus on key stakeholders and randomize the type of information they might get in order to figure out the causal relationship between these two variables. So the three um, stakeholders that we focused on are these. So we have tried not to focus on things that seem kind of eminently obvious. Um, for example, it's a great thing to improve supply chains, organizational efficiency. That sort of makes everybody win. But more to the things where the investment might lead to more uh, intangible returns. So some of these issues have already come up. So for example, are customers more responsive to either product services or firms that engage in these types of behaviors? Are people more willing to work for companies that are sustainable? Um, are they more willing to stay at companies? Do they do a better job? And then one piece of the puzzle, which um, some people don't mention a lot, is this idea of um, private politics, which is there's a lot of regulatory risk that firms face. So maybe by doing this kind of stuff, they're able to defray regulatory risk um, and prevent sort of activist groups from pressuring government to put more stri stringent and onerous regulations on firms. Um, so I'll describe kind of one uh, small pilot study we did with eBay. Um, and so this was a study where we had 
the same groups of products um, that people saw when they went to the eBay website. So some of them went through their browser, some of them went through uh, their mobile device, some of them got this over email. And the key thing we did is that a coin flip determined what they would see. And the important thing of having a coin determine it is that the coin is blind, right? So the coin doesn't have a stake in the fight. And so the reason why some people got exposed to Earth-friendly or non-Earth-friendly packages has nothing to do with what the firm wanted them to see or what the customer wanted to see. It was totally a random uh, decision. So this is exactly what uh, everything looked like. So these were identical sets of products with identical sets of prices. Half the people, when they went to the website, they saw this described as Earth-friendly summer deals. And then the other half saw them described as just summer deals. Um, and so we're going to see what happens when we did this. So Earth-friendly labeling decreased click-through rates by nearly 40% and decreased spending by customers by 60%. Um, so this is like a very initial uh, study. So we want to try to replicate this again and again. Um, so that's just a caveat. But um, a lot of people we've talked to were actually not very surprised by this. Um, so why are we finding this? So we're still kind of investigating this. But one reason we think this is going on in this specific uh, uh, sort of arena of these kind of deals websites on eBay is that people view this as a signal for price, right? So um, the thought experiment would be, let's say you walked into a safe bay and you only saw organic bananas for sale that day. A lot of people are going to say, I'm just going to not buy bananas this week, because they assume that the bananas are more expensive. Now, in that case, they would be right. In this case, they were wrong, because everything was the exact same price. But they're viewing the green labeling as a signal for price. So this was an important study to do at eBay because it showed that when we actually try to market sustainability to customers, it's going to be very heterogeneous. Um, that it's not going to be an obvious uh, direction one way or the other. Um, and specifically in this setting, where you have people that are looking for good prices, where you're not having a niche customer, um, where you're having a products that are broadly marketed to big groups of people, that this had substantial impacts on sales and click-through rates. Um, so this is actually causing us to do future studies where we try to change where we're going to implement this uh, messaging. So uh, one insight that came out of this is that we decided that in the future, it may not be a good idea to market the product this way. Because that's someone from the top coming down and saying, this is the right thing for you to do. But rather, after somebody buys a product and you tell them, this was a sustainable purchase you made, this is something that helped the earth, then that's sort of an endogenous, sort of organic decision they made, and that might increase future purchasing, future loyalty with the company. So those are some examples of things that we're looking at. Um, so that's just sort of an introduction to what we've been doing. And the key we're trying to say is, is that you have to randomize if you want to learn about what this stuff is doing. That people are always going to select. But if, just like we want to know whether pills work, if we want to know if the sustainability stuff work, we have to trust the coin to make that decision of who's getting this stuff and who's not. Um, so if you're interested in talking about some of this stuff uh, at two, we'd be happy to talk about it more. Thank you. Well, Neil gets the prize for the downer of the day fact. <laughs> Anyway, we'll, we can talk about it. I'm sure we'll talk about it a lot, Neil, you know, in, uh, in the Q&A session. Um, now to lift our spirits, Chris Field. We'll talk about, well, no, it's not quite right. It should be Chris. But are you OK with switching? Are you OK? No, no, leave it then. We'll, we'll just we'll go ahead. We'll let you, yeah. Roz, would you like to speak then? OK. <laughs> So uh, we're very flexible here, as you can tell. So Roz Naylor is a professor of environmental earth system science, and she's also the director of the Center for Food Security and the Environment, which is joint, as you heard this morning, between the Woods Institute and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. So Roz. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.
Thank you, and it's really great to have a chance to talk to you today. Some of the comments that I'm going to make come from collaborations at Woods as well as Earth Sciences, where my professorship is. Um, so what I want to do is start with a quote from Jason Clay at the World Wildlife Fund when he says in the beginning of an article, the single largest human impact on our finite planet comes from producing food. So it's a fairly bold statement, um, but it's true in so many ways. And he's referring to the fact that agriculture is the largest water user, the largest land user on the planet, biggest threat to biodiversity, a major contributor to greenhouse gases. But we do need to eat, and um, over the past 50 years, we've done so by um, intensifying our agricultural systems, like the system here in Indonesia, adding fertilizer, high-yielding high, uh, seed varieties, and doubling and tripling, tripling yields. And so we have been able to feed a growing planet. The next 50 years are going to be more challenging. Um, not only are we going to add 2 to 3 billion more people to the planet, a lot of these people, 70% or more, are going to be in urban areas. There will be more people in cities, in fact, than um, are even on the planet today, and causing more tension, I think, with water resources in particular. Climate change is going to unfold, making the yield growth a little more difficult. And what I want to focus on today is there's still going to be massive income growth going on. And as we heard from Greg Page earlier, the diversification of diets into meat, other animal products, and other products that require more land is going to become more pressing. In fact, today, um, most of the land use change that we see coming from agriculture is going into products that are going into emerging economies and more wealthy economies. Examples would include oil palm, palm or palm oil in the top slide here in Southeast Asia, cattle in Brazil, other parts of the Amazon. These are just examples. Um, but the fact, as the demand for these uh, more high-valued products continues, will we actually be able to, to sustain this activity? Now, you may look at this and say, oh my god, there's so much destruction here. But in fact, these systems could be good, too. For example, this oil palm plantation could be on land that had been degraded, degraded pasture land that was abandoned, or forest land that had been deforested and then abandoned and is now sequestering carbon and adding to employment and incomes. The cattle example down below, I know because I took this picture, um, was a rancher in Pará, Brazil, who actually had intensified the productivity of his pasture land so that he could have five times the number of cattle, very healthy on a, you know 20 percent of his land, and still saving 80 percent of his forests intact, according to the forest code in Brazil. So there are solutions as well as problems in this whole matrix. And I think whether you see the problem areas or these great solutions, again, depends on the core values of the companies or individuals you're talking about. So a lot of the motivation for my talk actually came from two very different sorts of experiences. Um, one is eating at Flea Street Cafe here, um, my favorite restaurant. If you haven't been there, you should go in Menlo Park. And Jessie Cool is one of our local food heroes. She spent the past 35 years really building supply chains between producers locally who are uh, following sustainable practices to a very loyal set of consumers, who, by the way, are quite wealthy. Um, but Jesse brings uh, great ethics and great values to this whole idea of sustainable food production. The question is, can we now scale it from the very local scale to a scale that matters for the planet? And the second inspiration actually comes from Cargill. <laughs> it's probably surprising my Cargill colleagues here. It was a, vi a visit to the uh, Blair campus near Omaha, Nebraska last year. Um, and this is located in the heart of Cornland. Um, the scale is so large, you know, 500, 600 trucks every single day of the year, with the exception maybe of Christmas, are rolling into this plant delivering corn. And it's being processed into livestock feeds, high fructose corn syrup ethanol, and a whole range of other products. But what's really interesting about this design is having the scale in one location like this means that the output of each part of the plant is the input for the next plant, so very little waste. And the energy efficiency is very high because not only is the output and input connected, but there's no transportation needed between segments here. Same with the water circulating between each segment of the industry and the water going out of this plant is even cleaner than the water going into the plant. 
economically, the scale has helped to attract a lot of new kind of um, businesses, including the biodegradable plastics and other businesses that are very innovative. And of course, it's creating a huge number of skilled and unskilled jobs in a tight location here. And so it's this sense of integration and maximizing efficiency of all the resources that I came away with here. And so the whole idea that I think about in this frame is uh, trying to alleviate some of the tensions that occur between scale, sustainability, and self-interest. And I want to give an example um, of the, actually the fastest growing segment of the world food economy is aquaculture, fish farming. As you can see, even relative to meat production, it's just skyrocketing, about 7.8% per annum over the past 20 years. And it's a really rich and diverse activity, 600 different species farmed in all sorts of different types of systems. One of the unifying features, though, is apart from the filter feeders, all of these systems require feed, and all of them have some inclusion of fish meal or fish oil in them. And so is aquaculture really going to save the oceans, or is it going to put more pressure on oceans? And I'm uh, going to give you an example of China because I'm going there next week to run a very large meeting and have been working on it. As you can see, China is undoubtedly the 800-pound gorilla in the room, 62% of global aquaculture production, and almost half of global aquaculture value. Most is these fin fish-like carps, but the sh sheer scale and moving into high-valued products means that it's really... Um, demanding much more fish as a feed um, ingredient now. So where is it getting this fish? If you look at the uh, map of fish meal trade around the world, Peru is the largest producer, Peruvian anchovy, and it's just zooming right over to China, essentially. China takes 30%, sometimes 60, 50 or 60% of the world market in any given year. And so scale is undoubtedly the big feature here. But what about sustainability? Does it make sense to take low-valued fish and make it into a high-valued product? Um, yes, as long as those fisheries are managed sustainably, but if not, uh, they could easily be depleted by China's demand alone, leaving, really stripping out uh, the bottom of the food web of this particular fishery on the um, Pacific here. And so finally, the self-interest is so uh, a big ingredient here because China actually has bought up fishing quotas in Peru, it controls some of the... Um, the processing technology there, and more generally around the globe, Chinese fleets are found in over 80 exclusive economic zones. They're fishing in 80 different countries. And so the economic dominance of the fishing industry is, is huge here. They do make some fish meal at home, a much smaller amount than what's imported. And they've pretty much fished out their large forage fisheries like Japanese anchovy. So most of their fisheries are multi-species fisheries where they just go with a trawler and catch everything and then sort it out, what goes to humans, what goes to feeds. And um, we would call this trash fish, but actually there's no word for trash fish in the Chinese language. And so we have dug through this pile. <laughs> there's about 56 species of fish in that pile, two thirds of which are um, juveniles of commercially valuable species. And so clearly the pressure is very high on marine resources here. So what are the solutions? And in this case, the solutions come through all of the different substitution opportunities and linking different parts of the global food system. For example, per unit cost of protein, feather meal or poultry meal is much less expensive than anchovy meal. Same with dry distiller grains or corn gluten meal. And so there's a lot of waste products from one aspect of the food, global food industry that can be used as an input to the nether part and we need to take advantage. Consumers get a little queasy knowing that their salmon is now made from chicken fat as opposed to anchovy meal. Um, these are the trade-offs that we're facing as a global society. Um, the other problem here, there's some nutritional aspects, but you want your fish to taste fishy, of course. Um, so the other major solution is why not take advantage of this huge scale of aquaculture that China is producing now Already, 70% of its supplies of fish are coming from aquaculture and use the processing waste to make fish meal. We spent a year sorting out how this would look, so I'm not going to run through all the calculations except to say that 
from the processing waste it has at its disposal today, it could make 1.3 million metric tons of fish meal, and it's currently importing about 1.2 million metric tons of fish meal. So this is a huge opportunity to take advantage of waste and use it as an input. Um, there are certain nutritional aspects, again, to get over, but it just seems like a great, great opportunity. Um, again, going back to the earlier slide, you would want to link it to energy efficiency, water efficiency, and the efficiency of the overall system. So I'll end on that note, just making this as a case for the connections between scale, sustainability, and self-interest. Um, I think the scale of our problems are so huge that we better think of really big scale solutions. And so sometimes they would be quite risky, but I think we need to be pretty bold. And obviously we want them to be sustainable. Self-interest is clearly the wild card. It can be, self-interest can be just, you know, normal business profitability intentions. It could be outright greed, taking resources from other countries, trying to dominate markets. Or it could be, and I think where we have all come across today, is self-interest really has to be synonymous with sustainability. Um, I think the challenge in the case I've presented is one I would like to go back to Secretary Jewell's comments today. How do you build a team of sustainability where the actors are so international? And Ben's comments just now, you know, the actors are coming from very different cultures with very different aspirations for economic dominance and, um, and, and solving their own consumer needs. And so it's an interesting and really challenging subject. I would also say um, some of the best innovations, I think, are going to have to come from pretty non-glitzy industries. You know, working with um, fish guts is not actually all that sexy, um, but after you get over the smell, it's not so bad. So thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to announce the next speaker until I see. Mm -hmm. So Roz gets the prize for the for the best um, for the best one-liner today. Fish guts is the new sexy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it is in fact uh, Chris Field. Chris, as you all know, is the director of the Carnegie Institute for Global Ecology. He's also a professor of biology and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute, and very involved in the IPCC, as you'll hear about now. Chris. Thanks, Jeff. As most of you know, we've had a unique partnership between the world's governments and the scientific community over the last 25 years or so to figure out what we know and what we don't know about the science of climate change. IPCC has really been uh, uniquely valuable, and it's interesting to think about what you get from having a comprehensive assessment of science in, in this discipline or in any other. Uh, this is, of course, the season of IPCC reports. There have been three in the last six months. The US National Climate Assessment will be coming out. I think it's tomorrow. Uh, if I step back and say, what are the two things that are different about the IPCC reports that have come out in this fifth assessment cycle? Uh, there are really two. Uh, the first is that there's much more of a focus on solutions. I think in the past, uh, climate change has been kind of uh, big, dire, and scary. And now I think climate change is big, dire, scary, and, and ripe with opportunities. Uh, the second is that I think in the past, there was a sense that climate change was really a domain onto itself, and that dealing effectively with climate change meant pushing everything else out of the way. Now it's much more clearly understood that climate change is really about everything. Climate change is about transportation, communication, public health, ecosystems, all aspects of the economy. And we really can't separate climate change from everything else we do in thinking about a sustainable future. Uh, here's, here's a conceptualization we use within Working Group 2, which deals with impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, to think about where risk from climate change occurs. And obviously, the physical changes in the climate, the forcing from high temperatures or high winds or heavy rain, are, are, 
are important to that. They, they push on the side of the system you might think of as, as hazards. Uh, but the risk of impacts really emerges not from the hazards themselves, but from the overlap between the hazards, uh, the vulnerability, who's susceptible to harm and why, and the exposure. What kind of assets do you have at risk? And it's only from the overlap of these three domains that the, that the risk of impacts emerges. It's also really important to recognize that we have a wide range of tools for dealing with the risk. Uh, obviously, reducing emissions is a powerful tool for addressing the, uh, the hazard side. Uh, but there are a wide range of things that can be done to address the vulnerability and exposure side. And of course, it's important to recognize that we could be doing things that to address the hazard side that are exacerbating things on the vulnerability and exposure side, or vice versa. And part of the reason that we need to have a comprehensive, thoughtful approach to this is that we want to make sure that the risk reduction challenge is, is reduced in a, in a comprehensive, systematic way. I want to say just a few things about where we are in terms of the climate changes that have occurred to date and the way that's altered our thinking about where we're headed, and then just a couple of things about where we're headed in the future. Uh, the first is that we, uh, unfortunately, have really turned a corner where climate change impacts aren't a hypothetical for the future. We've already seen a, a wide range of climate change impacts, consequential ones. Uh, we've seen them from the equator to the poles and from the coast to the mountains. Here's a, uh, an, an, an iconic map that presents individual cases of clearly documented impacts of climate change to, to physical systems, which is mainly um, cryosphere and hydrology, water flow and, and ice extent, uh, biological systems, mostly changes in timing, uh, changes in biological diversity, uh, changes in the activity patterns of plants and animals, and, and human impacts. And human impacts are uh, mainly impacts on the food system, but we're seeing an increasing number of documented impacts of climate change on uh, aspects of the economy, aspects of health, and aspects of um, conflict. And what you can see is that essentially there, there are impacts that have been documented everywhere. In many cases, climate change has a, a major component of the influence, and in other cases, it's a minor component of the influence. But there's no place that's uh, protected from the impacts of climate change. Uh, here's a specific example of the kinds of uh, impacts we're seeing. This one comes from uh, the work on food, mainly through the uh, program in food security and the environment, and Ross's colleague, David Lobel, showing that over the past several decades, we've already seen an impact of the climate changes that have occurred to date on the extent to which we've been able to increase yields in some of the world's major food crops. And you can see here for wheat, soy, rice, rice and maize, there have already been impacts on yield increases in wheat. It's about 2% per decade less yield increases as a result of all the other things we're doing than we would have otherwise seen as a consequence of climate change. And in maize, the effect has been about 1% per decade. You can think about climate change as already acting as an anchor, making it more and more difficult to achieve the kind of yield increases that we need to have in order to feed the future. A, a second really important feature of the new knowledge about climate change is an appreciation of, of who's vulnerable and why. Uh, we've known for a long time that there are dimensions of vulnerability that are exacerbated by poverty, by lack of access to resources, by poor governance. And some of those are the most challenging ones we see. Uh, but we also know now that Basically, we're sitting ducks everywhere. You know, we, we're, there's no place in the world that we're really prepared to deal with even current climate variability. And smart investments in dealing better with current climate variability can uh, play a big role in preparing us to deal more with the kinds of climate changes that we'll encounter in the future. It, it also is true, however, and it's very important as we begin to transition to thinking about solutions, that effective adaptation isn't an exotic agenda for the future. We're beginning to see real investments in adaptation planning, investment, and implementation at scales from communities up, up to nations. And some of the adaptations are high-tech engineering solutions, like this flood barrier at Rotterdam. Uh, but many are m much more community-based um, individual uh, deployments. This is a, a mangrove planting exercise in, in Tuvalu. Uh, mangroves can provide, in many cases, as, as much coastal protection as the kind of big flood barrier that you saw in the last image. 
I, I, I want to turn just for a couple of minutes toward where we think we're headed for the future. And if there's a, a single message from the new science that uh, highlights the issues for the future, it's that the amount of climate change risk that we experience with continued high emissions, basically a business as usual type of approach, is just dramatically different than the level of risk that we encounter with ambitious investments in mitigation. The way I think about it is that a, a world that ends up the 21st century at something like 2C, about four Fahrenheit above pre-industrial, looks and functions as a um, more complicated but similar version of the world we've got now, a world at 4C above pre-industrial, about 8 Fahrenheit, all bets are off. Here's a way to think about it. In the, um, in the left-hand panel here, you can see the historical trajectory of temperatures over the last century. Uh, you can see the red plume shows the continued high emissions temperature trajectory, the best estimates from the model, and the blue plume shows the, uh, the uh, likely consequences of the most ambitious likely estimates in, in mitigation. And there are two things that are worth noting in this image. The first is that there's a period of the next several decades. You can think about it as kind of an era of climate responsibility where the climate changes that we'll encounter are basically baked into the system. Independent of how ambitious we are with mitigation, the climate changes between now and probably the middle of the century are not going to be sensitive to that mitigation. We have to deal with those. That is the agenda for adaptation. However, it's also really clear that the consequences of climate change at the end of the century are very sensitive to investments that are made now. This is one of the biggest business challenges is the delay in the consequences. And if you look at the right-hand panel for the differences in impacts between sort of projecting the blue plume across or the pink plume across. You can see that the blue plume ends up in, in uh, mild to moderate levels of risk across a bunch of different sectors. And the, and the red plume ends up with, with uh, really high and I would argue unmanageable risk. One other thing I want to point out with the, um, the right hand panel is that the motivation for thinking more broadly than in simple-minded cost-benefit terms. There are a wide range of assets that we might want to protect in a, in a changing climate. And many of these are very difficult to monetize. When we think about rare, unique, and threatened systems and biological diversity, historical sites, archaeological sites, when we think about the distribution of impacts, this is the kind of the unfairness aspect of climate change. Many of the people who are most sensitive, the sectors that are most sensitive, contributed very little to the problem. And, and how do you think about protecting their access to a sustainable future as, as well as the, the access of the groups that have contributed the most? Large-scale aggregate impacts is one of the most challenging. We know that we're within uh, probably a few tenths of a degree C to being committed to eventual loss of the Greenland ice sheet with the concomitant 23 feet of sea level rise over several centuries. How do we think about that in the context of setting the, the, um, the, the costs and the benefits of dealing with climate change? A wide range of impact areas, and it's very difficult to set a price for those in a simple-minded cost-benefit analysis much easier to deal with those in a risk framing and in a framing that says, how much of a safety factor do I want to build into the future? And that's really where I want to close. You know, uh, we've had a number of really inspirational comments uh, already today about how to think about investments in the future in ways that, that aren't a drag on the economy, but are uh, opening broad new opportunity areas. And dealing with climate can be the same. Uh, thoughtful approaches to adaptation and mitigation. Uh, they can be a net drag on the economy or they can be the next big thing. They can be the foundation for the 21st century vibrant communities and robust economies. And I think that the responsibility is really in the business community, working with the scientific community, universities and governments to figure out what's the pathway to that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. And now our, believe it or not, our final speaker. If you've ever wondered, if you have been sitting here all morning waiting for your fill of 
partial differential equations and how they're related to balance sheets, this is your big opportunity. Because <laughs> Mike Leppert, who's an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering, is going to fulfill that dream. <laughs> well, plus, as the last talk of the day, you get to hear an accounting talk, which is everybody's favorite topic uh, right at the end of, end of things. Um, thanks, Jeff. So my research group here looks at quantitative sustainability metrics and how to infuse those into the designs of products, processes, and systems. And this work was really motivated by a lot of work with the folks at Disney who asked the question, how can we take our efforts in sustainability and try to turn them into a financial, you know, a financial metric that, that could convince our CFO and CEO that this was worthwhile in doing. And so that's why we started to move on to the idea of trying to do this uh, on the balance sheet. So a lot of the speakers today have chatted about environmental cost accounting. How do you use green initiatives to try to reduce the cost of doing business? And that can be environmental cost, risk mitigation, consequences, litigation. And that primarily gets reflected in the cost of goods sold uh, or reductions in overhead, less legal department, things of this nature. In the context of Bill McDonough, the green architect, author of Cradle to Cradle, much of this is doing less bad. That's a very good thing. But he proposes that we now need to make a shift from doing less bad to doing more good. And it's that doing more good that we often have problems with. Because when firms are going to do more good, you need a way to recognize that increased good. And so that's where we go from environmental cost accounting to what we call financial environmental accounting. Can natural systems and the preservation of those natural systems be considered as an important firm asset in the most formal way that you recognize assets, balance sheets? So here I've got a picture of a metal press. And coming from Michigan, uh, we do a lot of that metal pressing stuff. The folks at GM know all of what I'm talking about. And that metal press, of course, is put on your balance sheet using the cost that you purchased it at. And of course, if that cost of purchase was indeed reflective of just the stuff in it, meaning the metal, the electronics, the plastic, then it would have a pretty low value. You purchased it pretty cheaply, and the difference between the purchase price and the salvage price would be pretty much the same. But of course, the real value of that piece of equipment is the process which it delivers to your firm. It makes stuff, and that process is embodied in the intellectual property. So let's ask the question. If you can put this on your balance sheet, can you also put this on your balance sheet? If you own natural ecosystems, a tree, you can own the tree. We all understand that. Can you own the process by which that tree provides benefits to society, much like the process by which that piece of equipment turns raw steel into car parts? And we think the answer is yes, and that process is what really represents a great deal of value for our ecological systems, whether it's trees or natural uh, wetlands. But there are really, really large accounting challenges. And this is where most efforts to try to account for these things get, get, get caught up, in that there are really, really strict rules for how you can account for things as assets. Materiality. I would actually uh, love to talk more about to Ezra about the separation of firm materiality and sustainability materiality. I don't think those two are different. What's material to the firm should be material to the stakeholders, particularly for publicly traded companies. But you have to meet materiality uh, challenges. You also must apply, comply with international accounting standards, which have very, very specific rules on entities, stable cost assumptions, uh, whether it's relevant, reliable. And so you have to take all of these into account. And what we're trying to do here is take the science of, 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 of sustainability and translate it into that lexicon of bankers and accountants and your CFOs. Right. And we do that by starting, at, by starting with models of the function of nature. So as Jeff had promised, here we go, a couple differential equations, right? Here's one that uh, describes the, the movement of phosphorus in a, in, a, in a coastal wetland. But wetlands, grasslands and forests, just trees themselves provide basic functions by which we all benefit. 
our firms, and our society. Right? And those benefits can be tran translated directly into services through functional equivalency, making a, an assumption that indeed the service provided by natural systems can be replicated through engineered systems which have a very well-defined market-based price, which comply with reliability and entity concepts associated with IFRS. So for those of you with a finance background, you can get some idea what that means. And so we tie that ecosystem function to the benefit offered by engineered services as far as price goes. And then it can actually go onto a balance sheet. Uh, this is not a very foreign concept. International Accounting Standard 41, the most popular of all international accounting standards, <laughs> refers to biological assets. I told you this was going to be an exciting accounting lecture, right? Biological assets which refer to the management by an enterprise of the biological transformation of biological assets for sale. OK, whatever. The folks at Cargill know what this means. <laughs> Every farmer in the world knows what this means. Right. And it says that these can be recognized uh, at fair value. And in fact, if you are providing a, 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 a benefit, a service from nature, it is an accountable asset. It allows your firm to say the good things that we're doing in conservation they're part of our production function. They're assets that we're using as a society and as firms uh, to kind of uh, to, to, to quantify the service that we're provided by those natural ecosystems. The one thing that you can't see, because apparently the switch over from PC to Mac is a little difficult, um, is that this uses a mark-to-model approach. Many of you are familiar with mark-to-market approaches for asset valuation. And those say, well, if you have a, uh, an equity portfolio, you can just go to the Wall Street Journal and see what the market-based price is for your, uh, for your asset that day. Uh, that's very allowed through IFRS. But so are mark-to-model approaches, which use models to set uh, values. Right. So finally, just some conclusions. Right? Uh, accounting of natural ecosystems can certainly fit within traditional accounting frameworks. They can follow all of the rules as long as you know what they are and adhere to them correctly. Of, of putting more good on your balance sheet. We want to broaden the application of these types of valuations to private firms, but also to the financiers. We're doing a lot of work now with the banking sector. And for those of you from the banks in this room, you can believe the really neat things that we can do when you start to account for natural ecosystems. Come and talk to me. Uh, we're trying to encourage more comprehensive accounting of interactions by firms and the natural environment through, increased, through, through changes in hurdle rates, through changes in your balance sheet, and trying to, make, uh, trying to merge that lexicon of conservation uh, and, uh, and into the lexicon of firms, investors, and financiers. So we have lots of ongoing work. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, check out the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Uh, and its work to try to feather into the FASB, GASB. Um, more work that we're doing here, connecting with financiers and bankers. We see the banking industry as a real driver for sustainability, because all of this costs money. But if we can start to recognize the real value that sustainability efforts provide, uh, banking them is not, uh, is, is not that far-fetched of an idea. Uh, ongoing work also includes modeling of digital ecosystems, functions, and services, the science that goes on here at Stanford. Lots of people to acknowledge, graduate students, uh, Stefan, who left a little bit earlier, all kinds of folks for um, uh, funding the work. And then I think that's my 10 minutes, right, Jeff? All right. Let's get the panelists, please come up. Yeah. All right, so we do have about uh, 10, 12 minutes for questions, so please go ahead. Peter. Yeah, I was with uh, your presentation, the result you showed, I was having difficulty whether I would frame that as a test of sustainability or a test of the efficacy of greenwashing. Um, yeah, I think that's a fair point, point. Um, and so I think the the way to kind of frame the research is conditional on firms um, actually doing real stuff on this, uh, in this space. What is the best way to communicate that to customers? 
to sort of drive the bottom line. Uh, the one thing I will say is that it actually was not greenwashing in this example. Um, so we had to be truthful to the consumers. So all of the products for, for sale were uh, refurbished products. So they kept things out of landfills, stopped the production of new things. Um, and they were a kind of pitched that way as earth friendly. Um, but people seem to think of them as more expensive um, when they actually weren't. Yeah, Lisa. Hi, this is Lisa from Gab. I have a question for Chris and whether or not you've looked at um, the impact of climate change, uh, change on yield of cotton. I know you had some other. Um, I personally have not. David Lobel, who is kind of the uh, yield sustainability star of the Stanford community, has looked at cotton along with other people. And cotton is an interesting crop like soybean and maize. It has a very sharp temperature threshold, such that you'll see the yield going up and up and up and up and up, and then it just drops off a cliff. And the, the temperature threshold, you probably remember, is like 29C. Yeah. Pam, did you want to say anything on that? Do you want to? No. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Chris, this, I'm Bruce Hartzoff from Intuit. I have a question actually on the um, way the IPCC is doing its work. There's been a lot of discussion, I think, about the multi-year assessment cycles and given the increasing urgency, uh, if there would be like a sixth assessment or if this would start to move more into like a continuous contribution model. What do you see in terms of where the IPCC's work will be going uh, in that regard? I think the IPCC needs to get its act together and think really hard about the answer to that question. <laughs> if it was up to me personally, I would try and think about an, a next iteration of the IPCC that sustains the features that are unique, the, the strong government buy-in, the really rich geographic participation. But think about maybe rolling assessments so it was a real product that addressed the most critical questions on a yearly or even semi-annual basis in a way that kept you up to date at the same time it maintained the quality of the assessment. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, Sylvia from Chevron, or I should just say she the Chevron lady. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if um, IPCC has given some thought um, about solutions to um, investments that we could make today for the end of the century, since you mentioned that our track to four degrees Celsius is already baked into the system, and I assume that's transportation and the fleets that have to be converted and a whole host of other things. So um, just if, wondering if you could speak to uh, yeah, so, solutions uh, that, the, that our the, investors or so in the, 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 the economy can... The overall set of technologies necessary to be on the blue plume, the one and a half to two and a half C plume, is mostly things that are uh, either available now or uh, not, not over the horizon technologically. A lot of the issues are scale issues. And essentially, the, you know, the, the portfolio of options includes a lot of things related to conservation, not cutting down tropical rainforests. A lot of things are related to efficiency, many of which we heard about. Um, a lot of things related to new technologies, the kind of the standard dialogue of, um, of mitigation with wind, solar, nuclear potentially, and then a lot with CCS. And, and one of the things that becomes most clear when you look at the overall energy universe with uh, growth and consumption at the order of something like you know, 800 one gigawatt power plants per year, it's hard to imagine a future in which some of the big fossil companies aren't key players just because they know how to do things at scale. Uh, they just need to do things smarter than they have been in the past. I think one of the things that's, that, that's also a, a component of that is every single one of those implementations uh, costs money. Uh, even if it's got a good payback time, you need an initial investment. Uh, and, and I think, you know, so I had talked about the, the, the financial services sector. I think that's a really important component to this, making sure that that sector understands what the real value proposition is behind this uh, and, and doing more than just looking at economic ROI um, so that, that, that we can start to implement some of these things in, in, a, in a realistic way. And I hear all of that, which I think is significant and important, but 
we can do a lot in emerging, or I mean, in developed countries such as the United States on conservation <laughs> and efficiency, but you also mentioned rising middle classes in developing countries who don't have the same incentives to be as efficient or to conserve, but rather expand. Um, so what are the, the, the issues on what you know, one economy can do versus what another economy does? Let me just say that uh, the, the longer you delay, on implementation of mitigation actions, and the less comprehensive the participation is, the more complicated things get. But then from a, any kind of an equity framing, it's really hard to see why the initial burden should be as heavy on the world's poor as it is on the richer countries. And so I think we have an uh, incredibly important dialogue ahead of us. The world wasn't terribly successful with the Kyoto Protocol, and so whether or not we see next steps through something like the UN Framework Convention or other mechanisms, uh, figuring out what are uh, viable mechanisms for burden sharing are among the most critical. Uh, I've been really impressed at the number of developing countries, especially the Chinese, who seem incredibly willing to step up the challenge of making uh, realistic commitments, uh, assuming that they see uh, balanced commitments from the, from the rich countries. And I would say that China has also invested in solar and some of the renewables at a scale that is really quite impressive in terms of bringing that into the market. Yeah, uh, Steve Luby had his hand up, and then who else wanted it? And then uh, Ben after that, yeah. Steve, go ahead. Oh, Steve, can you yell loud? <laughs> Chris, you um, argue that much of the um, rise in global temperatures are baked in, um, presumably because of the long half-life of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. Um, and, and so that, that, uh, that there is little that we can do to alter that trajectory. I would just be interested in your comments on whether black carbon emissions are something that we might be able to get a more um, immediate response to and where that might um, fit in terms of priorities. Right. Let me make it really clear that the changes over the next few decades are mostly baked in. The changes over the second half of the century are totally at our choice. And with ambitious commitment to mitigation in the near term, uh, we can look at a period after the 2050s with almost no net warning. The, there are two big components to the uh, inertia in the climate system. Some of them are geophysical, and it has to do with the way heat's redistributed in the atmosphere and ocean. A lot of those are embedded in the global economy, and they have to do with the power plant that was just constructed yesterday. The, the real challenge with the radiative budget of the Earth is that climate change is a cumulative problem. We are dealing tomorrow with the total uh, radiative effect of all the greenhouse gases that have been emitted, uh, with the short-term, short-lived gases going away more quickly. And there are, well, the problem is complicated enough that there are strong motivations for working on every contributor to greenhouse forcing. And the choice of whether the real focus is on CO2, which is very long-lived, on black carbon or uh, ozone-forming gases, which tend to be very short-lived, I think has, has more to do with capitalizing on the economies that are presented in the policy sphere and in the, um, in the economic sphere. Uh, we should be doing all those things. The, the real motivation for keeping a strong focus on CO2 is that historically the development of technology and the um, advancement of development in emerging economies has been to push down the levels of uh, the, most of the short-lived gases, and it's really the long-lived ones that represent the things that don't get addressed without explicit policy attention. All right, Ben, and then... Is there one more? Yeah, OK, we'll, we'll finish with, uh, with Al. So, so this is a question maybe for uh, Mike and Roz. By treating an ecosystem uh, service as an asset, you, in the same way that you do a machinery or equipment, you kind of imply that this ecosystem function can be improved, if you will. And in the case of uh, fish farming, the, you duplicate many of the things that fish growth in the wild do. So uh, is there some kind of fundamental difference in the way that you're treating these that would say that you can't improve natural systems or you shouldn't or 
anyway, that's, that's basically the idea. Maybe even Chris wants to weigh in on that one, but. You want to start? Uh, so uh, the idea of engineering your ecosystems to maximize asset value is a, a very scary concept. Uh, I think that we saw that through the monoculture of corn. Um, to try to move towards a, a, the most valuable commodity that, 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 that we could find. But Roz can provide a little more detail on that. Um, that being said, uh, we would need to have some type of combination of regulation uh, along with these standards to prevent that from happening. And, uh, and I, I think if I go any further on the regulation thing, you'll probably uh, get up and uh, get me, Ben. Yeah, and I, and I think um, the engineering the kinds of systems like replacing wild fisheries by, by aquaculture would be a really good one. Um, there's unintended consequences that still go <laughs> to the natural <laughs> systems that um, I think people don't necessarily take into account and maybe don't value those aspects of it. Um, I think we should work to yeah, right, together yeah, actually right, yeah. on this because, because that natural system dependency still exists in so many cases. You might see it um, in, in my case with the feeds was, it was an example on crop production. Um, you know, we have a basically free e ecosystem that we're dumping a lot of nitrogen into from all of our fertilization and that whole intensification. Uh, Pam Matson and Peter Vitusik have worked a lot on this really depends on fertilizer and depends on that for productivity and, and in some sense you can intensify and in a way and engineer a solution and yet the unintended consequences of where that nitrogen drifts and deposits and goes into groundwater and into hypoxic zones are not really accounted in our system at all. And so, you know, these are the kinds of unintended consequences I think that pop up. All right, Adam, you have a quick one. Thanks, it's really a illuminating panel. And uh, this one's for you, Michael, as well. Uh, in a lot of these discussions, one of the hopeful uh, solutions is to try to get the right mix of internalizing profits and externalizing liabilities and getting pricing signals to, to work the right way so we can use markets. Um, can you share some examples of companies really using this now and uh, your, your accounting methods or at least exploring it beyond, obviously Disney is, and are you willing to make a prediction as to what the increment to enterprise value could be uh, for a company that really uh, could harness uh, ecosystem? Right. So uh, Disney is the first example, right? And I, let me just, we'll get beyond Disney in, in a second. I think it was, was Ben that had, had, had told me his trepidation when uh, they presented the idea of ecosystem service valuation to their CFO who said, um, all right, this is just the way we're going to evaluate every project from now on. Uh, we want to make sure that there is a, a, level, uh, a level ecosystem service value from the beginning to the end of the project. And if we're going to do development, we're going to make sure that we uh, get no decrease in overall ecosystem service valuation. Now, the trepidation in that is we actually have very few ecosystem services actually quantified to the level where we can get a really good valuation on them. Uh, and so there's all kinds of externalities that get, that get lost. Other firms, um, uh, where's the Chevron lady? <laughs> we've, we've actually been talking to the folks at Chevron, a big landowner, right, uh, who, who are interested in, in, in many of these in many of the same things. The other folks uh, are not firms, um, but rather are municipalities. Right? They own lots of natural ecosystems, right? And, and, and being able to put those ecosystems on their balance sheet, their parks, as assets on their balance sheets completely changes their financing model. Because all of a sudden, they go to the financial markets and say, look at all these assets we have. We need money to maintain our assets, not to pay the park service salaries. That's a very different discussion, a very different financing model. And so that's why both FASB and GASB are so important to this. Does that answer your question? All right, I think uh, we've actually reached the bewitching hour. So there is, before, uh, but why don't we thank the panel once again. Thank you.